Good evening, everyone. My name is Bob Abbey, and I'm an adult services librarian for the city of Forest Grove. I'd like to welcome you to our program this evening and evening with Omar El Akkad. There I am. Thank you to everybody who is watching tonight on our YouTube channel or dialing in via Facebook. I want to remind you all that this is an interactive event and uh, we welcome your questions and comments. If you're watching on Facebook, you can just pop those questions and comments right in the comment function. If you're on YouTube, you've got to have a YouTube account in order to interact. If you want to set one of those up, that's fine. If you want to go over to Facebook and watch us there, that's fine too. But we really encourage you to share your questions and comments with us throughout the evening. It's not going to bother us. It's not an interruption. Uh, they just wind up over on the side and um, I'll check them from time to time and uh, uh, we'll get to those at the end of the evening. So as a starting point, uh, I want to just uh, take a second to uh, introduce our guest tonight, Omar El Akkad, the Portland author. Uh, book list called his 2017 debut novel, American War, a brilliantly well-crafted, profoundly shattering saga of one family suffering in a world of brutal power struggles. And the writer David Means praised it as a work of a singular, grand, brilliant imagination. And in his most recent novel, What Strange Paradise, Omar turns his attention to the global refugee crisis. Um, this is a, a very timely book, a very powerful book, and uh, I'm really excited about having Omar here to talk with us this evening and to introduce this work to you. And I'm going to bring Omar in. Hi, good evening, Omar. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much for, for doing this, for letting me be a part of it. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, we chatted a little bit before we got started, and I I mentioned that you've been doing a lot of these lately, so uh, <laughs> we're, you're kind of a kind of a, you know kind of old pro at this. But uh, I hope it's tonight it's not going to seem that way in a minute. Don't trust me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm sure we're going to touch on some things that will be um, uh, new, and also I think things that will be really exciting for our viewers as they get to know this work and as they get to know you. So um, we're really really excited about that. I think what I'd like to do is get out of the uh, stream and have you do a little reading to get us started off. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I, I really, really appreciate it. Um, I um, So my name is Omar. I'm a writer. I was born in Egypt. I now live just south of Portland, Oregon, in the woods out here, uh, which you can't quite see. I've turned the camera to show you the woods, but it's getting dark now, and it's mostly moths at this point, trying to get into where the light is. Um, I wrote a novel a few years ago called American War. This is the new one with Strange Paradise. Um, it's a repurposed fable of sorts. It's a, um, I took the, the original Peter Pan myth, legend, fable, and uh, reinterpreted it as a story of a contemporary child refugee. Um, so we open on an unnamed Western island in the Mediterranean. There's been a shipwreck, a migrant shipwreck, the sole survivor is a, is a nine-year-old boy named Amir. Uh, the moment he wakes up, the authorities chase him down because he's the only one alive and they want to detain him. He runs into the forest. On the other side of the forest, he finds the house where a 15-year-old girl named Vanna lives. And she decides in the moment to take him in and uh, shelter him and hide him from the authorities. From that point, the book alternates into before and after chapters. The after chapters are everything that happens once the boy arrives on the island. And the before chapters are the story of how he ended up there in the first place. Um, so what I'm going to do, if you'll indulge me, is just read you um, the very first, uh, I guess, the first two and a half pages of the first chapter. So this is, this is the opening of the book. The child lies on the shore. All around him, the beach is littered with the wreckage of the boat and the wreckage of its passengers. Shards of decking, knapsacks cleaved and gutted, bodies frozen in unnatural contortion. 
Dispossessed of nightfall's temporary burial, the dead ferment indecency. There's too much of spring in the day, too much light. Face down with his arms outstretched, the child appears from a distance as though playing at flight. And so too in the bodies that surround him, though distended with seawater and hardening, there flicker the remnants of some silent levitation, a severance from the laws of being. The sea is tranquil now, the storm is past. The island, despite the debris, is calm. A pair of plump, orange-necked birds, stragglers from a northbound flock, take rest on the lamppost from which hang one end of a police cordon. In the breaks between the wailing of the sirens and the murmur of the onlookers, they can be heard singing. The species is not unique to the island, nor the island to the species, but the birds, when they stop here, change the pitch of their songs. The call is an octave higher, a sharp, throat-scraping thing. In time, a crowd gathers near the site of the shipwreck, tourists and locals alike. People watch. The eldest of them, an arthritic fisherman driven in recent years by plummeting cherub fish stocks to kitchen work at a nearby resort, says that it's never been like this before on the island. Other locals nod, because even though the history of this place is that of violent endings, of galleys flipped over the axis of their oars and fishing skiffs tangled in their own netting, and once during the war, an empty Higgins lander sheared to ribbons by shrapnel, the old man is still in his own way right. These are foreign dead. No one can remember exactly when they first started washing up along the eastern coast, but in the last year it has happened with such frequency that many of the nations on whose tourists the island's economy depends have issued travel advisories. The hotels and resorts, in turn, have offered discounts. Between them, the Coast Guard and the moor keep a partial count of the dead, and as of this morning it stands at 1,026, but this number is as much an abstraction as the dead themselves are to the people who live here, to whom all the shipwrecks of the previous year are a single shipwreck, all the bodies a single body. Three officers from the municipal police force pull a long strip of caution tape along the breadth of the walkway that leads from the road to the beach. Another three wrestle with large sheets of blue boat cover canvas, trying to build a curtain between the dead and their audience. In this way, the destruction takes on an air of queer unreality, a stage play bled of movement, a fairy tale upturned. The officers, all of them young and impatient, manage to tether the fabric to a couple of lampposts, from which the orange-necked birds whistle and flee. But even stretched to near tearing, the canvas does little to hide the dead from view. Some of the onlookers shuffle awkwardly to the far end of the parking lot, where there's still an acute line of sight between the draping and four television news trucks. Others climb on top of parked cars and sweep their cameras across the width of the beach, some with their backs to the carnage, their own faces occupying the center of the recording. The dead become the property of the living. Oriented as they are, many of the shipwreck bodies appear to have been spat up landward by the sea, or of their own volition to have walked out from its depths and then collapsed a few feet later. Except the child. Relative to the others, he is inverted, his head closest to the lapping waves, his feet nestled into the warmer, lighter sand that remains dry even at highest tide. He is small, but somewhere along the length of his body marks the sea's furthest reach. A wave brushes gently against the child's hair. He opens his eyes. Thank you for sharing that uh, and, and reading from chapter one of What Strange Paradise. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned uh, before we went on that I've read this chapter several times and uh, each time I come back to it, I pull out something that I hadn't uh, noticed before. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the inspiration for this opening image. I, I would imagine that many people would uh, recall Alan Kurdi um, and the, the, the horrific image of this young child um, lying on a beach um, and, and the other image that came to mind is, uh, the, um, 
Oscar Alberto Martinez and uh, his 23-year-old daughter, uh, Angie Martinez, uh, El Salvadoran uh, refugees who died on the Rio Grande. What was your inspiration for this particular image of uh, Amir? Um, so so the, the genesis of the book, when I first started thinking about the things that eventually became What Strange Paradise, uh, predates both images. It's from 2012. Um, I was in Egypt. I was still working as a journalist at the time. And, and um, um, I was talking to a friend of mine, an old high school buddy about, he was complaining about rent and, and the rent's too high, the rent's too high. And I was asking him, well, what's the, the price of a, a, an apartment in your building? And he said, well, do you mean the locals price or do you mean the Syrians price? And it became clear then that there were if you were one of the refugees who had, who had come to Egypt, they could charge you three times as much because you had no choice. You were sort of stuck there. Um, and that how readily society managed to sort of exploit its most vulnerable was a starting point for me to, to think about the things that eventually became this novel. Over the course of its construction, those two images in particular, when each one arrived, was seared into my head. Um, not only the obvious horror and and what it says about the baseline cruelty of a society that would allow this to happen over and over and over, but also the fact that with both of these images, um, it arrived wrapped in this immense outrage. People were infuriated that we could allow this to happen for about 24 hours. And then the following day, there was something else to be outraged about, and we all kind of moved on. And that, of course, was sort of one of the defining elements of living in the Trump era, where there was a new scandal, a new uh, thing to be outraged about every day. But what I wanted to do as much as possible with this book was the opposite of that. I wanted to dwell. I wanted to stay. And so um, the same is true of American War. Going into this project, I knew exactly what the opening was, and I knew exactly how the novel would end. And I had very little idea of what was happening in between. So in the case of What Strange Paradise, it was down to the paragraph. I knew exactly what my opening paragraph was, was going to be. I knew exactly what my closing paragraph was going to be. And the middle, I sort of, it took me a long time to find the connective tissue. But um, once I came into that before, after sort of alternating chapter mode, um, it helped me do a couple of things that finally brought it together. But, but I wanted to start with that image and I wanted to close with that image. Hmm. The um, your, your comment about uh, the the sort of passing outrage and the privilege to uh, take a stand on something and then move on to something else, I think, also comes out in this opening tableau. Right? You have tourists who are uh, interacting with this scene in various ways, but it seems as though ultimately they the main concern on their on, on their minds is how is this going to impact my ability to go down on the beach or you know go sit in the sun or something so that that the 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 image and the 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 occurrence is a pretext for um how this impacts them and maybe that that forgetting that act of forgetting is uh, something that we have the privilege to do right um that's very unique to our position yeah, I mean, it's it's one of the foundational advantages of privilege, right? Is this notion that you can skate, you can skate along the surface and never once consider, even in the abstract, that you might be complicit in any of this. So, you know, a lot of times I will read from the opening section that I just read from, which has the line about the, some of the tourists standing up on the cars and they're and they're waving their cameras along but they're waving it in such a way that the camera is facing them so so they occupy the center of the frame well every virtual event that i've done where i've read from that section it's my face occupying the center of the frame i'm just as complicit and it's an open question as to whether i had a right to even write this book in the first place this question of what we've constructed on a societal level and how much human suffering has become baked into the system, has become necessary for the system to function, is not one that is comfortable to address. Um, because a lot of that misery has been 
is, is part of a pipeline that leads to my house being warm right now. And that leads to me finding 12 different kinds of peanut butter at the grocery store when I head over there. And so to try in any way to kind of dismantle that or assess it in terms of complicity, even passive complicity, um, I think is a difficult thing because you're pulled into it. And a lot of people would much rather not be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you talked about slowing down. And uh, as I mentioned before we went on, one of the things that really struck me about this opening chapter is uh, something that might seem kind of insignificant. You might read it in passing, but uh, you talk about um, objects that each of the individuals who made this trip brought with them, the things they carried with them, right? That had significance, that had meaning, that 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 took on something more than what they might seem, but yet they're laid out on this beach and they've been their their significance is all sort of decontextualized and leveled, flattened. And one of the things that I really appreciate about your book is how you you interrogate that tendency to level experiences. And and we can talk about this later on. I'm interested in getting your your uh, comments about about the uh, the characters who are on the boat on the calypso but I, I as i as i look at those those objects as i think about those objects a phrase book right this is this is a, a an object that is connected to communication to survival to hope um and and yet it it didn't prevent that person from dying i mean the the significance of it is 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 placed in in a different context, but I appreciate that moment to stop and really reflect on those on those objects. Yeah, it's 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 a kind of human topography, um, and it's a lot of those items. Um, I actually I happen to have on this desk right now because we're shooting a video for this award ceremony for an award I'm about to go and lose. Um, but uh, <laughs> so I happen to have. A lot of the um, a lot of the books that I, that I use. So you know, the morning they came for us, which is a, a harrowing book, um, mm -hmm. uh, and this one in particular, the New Odyssey, which Patrick Kingsley wrote, is a really stunning achievement because he wrote it in the middle of the crisis. He was writing this stuff in real time, mm -hmm. and um, the, the, the 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 again the sort of like the a secondary topology of of items. So you have things like, for example, um, balloons. You, you jam something into a balloon, you tie up the balloon, you have a better waterproof container than the kind of stuff that I could go to R REI and spend, you know, 60 bucks on. Um, lemon juice, a vial of lemon juice to, to sort of uh, save off uh, nausea. Um, all of these things, were, you know, I didn't make them up whole cloth. They're, they're a functional part of, of this journey for many, many people. Um, and then there are the life jackets, the life jackets, which in the book, I'm not really spoiling anything. You find this out very, very quickly. They're filled with foam. The smugglers have sold life jackets to, to the folks making this journey, but they're full of foam. So when you fall into the water, they do the opposite of what they're supposed to do. So you have this boat journey where people are fighting over these things and they're desperate to wrap them, not knowing that it's sort of like carrying an anvil into the water. Um, again, I didn't make that up. That's part of the the, the, the one of one of many ways in which these smugglers sort of uh, exploit and, and essentially don't care if these people live or die. Um, but it also, for me, has something to do with agency. You know, almost everyone on this boat has been stripped of any real say over what they what they do to themselves, what they do to others. Agency has been removed from the equation, and these items represent a kind of proxy agency. The things you bring with you and how you use them is a minor a minor chord of agency, and so it plays that role throughout the book. As, as a kind of something on which to project some semblance of control over your life when your life clearly has very little of that in it. Mm -hmm. And you, you mentioned the, the, the sort of cold number of dead bodies and you talk about it as an abstraction, right? And it's, it's just, it's just a number. They all start running together after a while and, and, and how to really, to really reflect on that. We have to pause, we have to pull back and we have to examine what that means, what what that number means in terms of losses of human life, right? And that each day it's repeated over and over and over again. Um, so that that 
that invitation to to pause, I think, is is what really strikes me so much about this first chapter, really, which is sort of setting the scene. Um, the other thing that that really struck me about this is uh, the sort of performative nature of all of this. That we're watching all of this happen. We're we're spectators, and there are spectators in the narrative who are watching all of this happen. So there there maybe it gets back to this idea about you know how you're in the center of the screen but that sense of almost being voyeurs of watching people do this and not being able to to step in right not being able to 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 do anything about it we're 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 complicit in it and that that i think that kind of tension uh makes this opening chapter really powerful well, thank you for that. I mean, it's it's. Um, I do subscribe to what Zadie Smith said about working on the first fifteen pages of your book <laughs> as much as you work on all the rest of it put together, sort of thing. The first chapter went through. Um, I mean, the first paragraph went through a ton of rewrites. I have thirty or forty versions of that sitting around on the computer somewhere. But the the, the first paragraph had a version of that happen as well. Mm -hmm. um, for lack of a better word, it's a book that steals from a lot of different places. You know, there's there's a lot here that's stolen from the Odyssey from Paradise Lost, from the Apocrypha, the Book of Nicodemus in particular. Um, the two central points of theft, literary theft in this book are in on the epigraphs page. There's a line from uh, the Ambrose Beers short story An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, which if you're familiar with it, you, you have a pretty good idea of what the structure of this book is going to be. <laughs> and then the other one is from Peter Pan, the original Peter Pan by J.M. Barry, which again, I have, I have, I'm so happy I have these books out here. Um, <laughs> if you ever want to read a really sort of illuminating and heartbreaking um, biography, J.M. Barry and the Lost Boys, which is the story of J.M. Barry's life, particularly when he was writing Peter Pan. Um, so so um, that started as a, as a stage play, it started as a performative thing. It was very much a, a performance, a literal performance. Um, and one of the things I was trying to do was was to get at this notion of of sort of what is necessary in a performance, um, and and it comes down to the sort of audience reaction. I mean, Jam Barry at his time was I think the most famous playwright in the world. He was also a deeply miserable man. He was he was very very unhappy almost all of the time. But it, he he the the projection is more important than the thing. And so you've got these guys running around who are sort of, you know, putting up tarps and stuff, which aren't going to, to help anybody on the other side of the bay. They, they do nothing except in a performative sense. Uh, the same thing with the people filming this. That is purely a performative construct. Um, and I, I, I wanted to sort of um, dive into that. And, and make it as much as possible a part of the story. Because I think if you're gonna talk about complicity, you can't not talk about that. You can't not talk about this sort of, because the reality of it is like you said, an abstraction, right? That number 1026 is not the number of dead, it's the number of dead who've washed up on the shore. Nobody has any idea how many people are at the bottom of the sea. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was invited to give a, a talk to Air Force cadets. Um, which I, I don't know why they asked me. I have no idea, but I was happy to do it. But it was part of this day long conference. And so we're sitting there, we're watching the opening of the conference and there is this officer who comes up and he has a PowerPoint in the back and it's a bunch of like, you know, top line numbers. So, because it was on the anniversary of nine 11. And, and so the first number is the number of dead from the nine 11 attacks. And that is a specific number. That is an accurate count of the dead. And then there's a bunch of other numbers. And then at the bottom, there's 900,000. And then right next to it, it says roughly the number of people killed in the ensuing war or something like that. And to me, it was, it was the quintessential sort of differentiator. Some people mm -hmm. have specific deaths. All people should have specific deaths. All deaths are specific. Um, but at a certain point, it becomes an abstraction. And um, I think, I think I wanted that collision of, the abstraction of human life and the performative nature um, at the same spot. And I think that sort of governs the, the opening of the book and a lot of what comes after. Mm -hmm. So you talk about the uh, quote from Ambrose Bierce, occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, uh, which uh, for readers or viewers who don't know it is you should, you should just, once we're done here, you should just 
read it. It's it's short. <laughs> it's a great great story. Um, but I, I'm I'm assuming this that when you talk about that, the structure you mean is the sort of in the present and then the flashback and then the in the present. Uh, is there something more that we can take from that um, occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge? I mean, it relates to, because I write these incredibly depressing novels, I'm, I'm often <laughs> asked about, where's the hope? You know, where's the hopefulness? And I think it relates to the idea of what hope means. Um, I, you know, it's, it's, when I wrote American War, I, I, I thought I was doing one thing and I thought that thing would be readily identifiable and, and that readers would read it that way. And overwhelmingly American war has been read as an entirely different kind of book. Hmm. You know, I was trying to superimpose another people's story onto the, the most powerful empire in the world. And instead it was read as this kind of literal prophecy of where America is headed. And, you know, that was all great for book sales, but it had, it had very little to do with, with what I intended. And I thought this wasn't going to be the case with what strange paradise I thought the, the sort of literary trick that I was employing was, was pretty straightforward. Um, and the first four people to read the manuscript had four entirely different interpretations of what was going on in this book. Mm -hmm. And that's when I knew that I was in for sort of a similar ride. And since that time, I've, I've gotten so many different versions of what's happening in this book, including some that are so outside what I intended that I, they're fascinating to me. One of the writers who was kind enough to blurb the book had an interpretation of the book that I had not considered in the slightest. Um, and so what I thought I was doing was very closely related to the structure of, of that story. Uh, but since that time, I've there's, there's actually a, a fairly decent thread on Goodreads, on the Goodreads page for the book where someone asks a question that's essentially what the hell is going on. And then a bunch of answers sort of trying to get at it. And it's one of my favorite sort of outposts of, of thought about this book is um, I, I used to be really scared of that. I used to be really frustrated when the thing I intended was different from the thing readers got. And as I get older, I, um, I find that much more comforting. I think if something's going to outlive me and sit on a shelf collecting dust long after I'm dead, it should have as many different lives as, as possible. Hmm. Well, since we've, I mentioned the the structure, and you you alluded to the structure. So the 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 structure of the book is to alternate um, before and after chapters. So we're we're kind of braiding the narrative to get to a to a sort of a central point. When you were when you were writing this, did you what was your, what was your your um, your approach for for structuring that kind of narrative? So initially it was, it wasn't there, the before and after that showed up about halfway through. So this book went through about eight drafts and it was somewhere around four that I, that I decided to do before and after as a, as a construct. Um, prior to that, I, I had stuck very closely to the Peter Pan mode. So there were 17 chapters in the original story form of Peter Pan. So I kept it 17 chapters and that clearly wasn't working. It was a very sort of contrived thing. Uh, and at one point I sort of stumbled onto this idea of going back and forth. And one of the things that allowed me to do was take a couple of story threads and break them apart in such a way that I can tell you certain things about them up front and, um, and sort of close that chain later on in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of this stuff is, is sort of fairly obvious on a surface level. Some of it is really sort of buried deep beneath the book. So um, for example, there's, there's a scene early on in the book where Vanna, who's living on this island, um, she's she's really annoyed at the nightclub down down by the shore. There's this sort of nightclub that's populated by tourists, and they keep playing the same rap song over and over again. And I never state it outright, but if you sort of read between the lines, it's the song Big Pimpin by Jay-Z. Right? <laughs> Fast forward to later on in the book, the migrant ship is approaching the island, and one of the Egyptians hears some music, and they say... Hey, listen, it's our people. Can you hear them? They're playing our song. They're playing Khosara Khosara. Well, Big Pimpin samples a mid-20th century Egyptian pop song called Khosara Khosara. The, the overlap of people with a cultural knowledge that includes Daisy's <laughs> discography and mid-20th century Egyptian pop is, is it's me and like three other people, right? So, um, but, but because of the before and after thing, I could, I could play around with that sort of thing. Um, hmm. 
And the other thing I could do is I could create in the after, the after world, um, an entirely fantastical space. So it's based on the um, uh, on the eastern edge of Crete, but I've misshapen it and I've taken all the flora and fauna and replaced it with fantastical flora and fauna. So uh, in one of the copy edited versions, there's a whole bunch of notes from my copy editor saying, "What the hell are cherub fish? What are sunheads?" I googled these things; they don't they don't show up. <laughs> um, so I sort of it allowed me to, to keep one portion of the book and make it entirely fantastical um, just on a geographic sense and a sort of, you know, uh, a layout sense. Uh, so all of those things fit in place once I hit upon that, that way of structuring it. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned that, um, that kind of bifurcation of, of events. I, I, I've always thought it's interesting if you could have a story where where something happens and then there's a scene of the same thing happening with a different perspective and the person who was in the center of the frame in the first um, iteration is kind of off on the side somewhere and so we're seeing it from sort of two different angles but it's a, it's the same event just different perspectives so that's that's fascinating that that and that that different layer of meaning as well that this this song that means something to one person then takes on a different meaning, a completely different meaning, right? Because they're listening to it for different things um, uh, is, is fascinating. So we've mentioned the character of Vana, who is um, uh, a 15 year old. Uh, tell us a little bit about her. Yeah, she's, she's my Wendy. Um, she is, when we first meet her, she is bored out of her mind. She lives on this quiet island that is frequented by tourists, but has very little else going on. Uh, doesn't have a very close relationship with either of her parents for very different reasons. Um, she's half Swedish, half uh, Greek, although that's never sort of overtly stated. It's another one of those sort of between the lines kind of thing. Um, and she, to me, is a sort of, she's someone who's trying to, she's struggling with, with what it means to be a good person when so much of your trajectory in life seems to be preordained by the accident of your birth and whatever qualities you are born into. So the color of your skin, the familial wealth in, into which you were born, uh, the geography, the place, ethnicity, so on and so forth. And she's trying, you know, because she understands that she's privileged in many of those, along many of those axes. And she's trying to figure out how to be a good person in that context um, when, when so much of it has been determined essentially by, by accidents of fate, things with which she had no, no real involvement. Um, one of the things I was thinking about when I was, when I was thinking about that character is, is um, when I was about four years old, so I was born in Egypt, but I didn't grow up there. When I was four years old, my father wanted to get the hell out. Uh, the economic situation was horrible. The political situation was horrible. So he ends up getting a job offer in Libya. So we're at the airport and we're waiting for the, for the flight. And my father's name is Muhammad Ahmed Al-Aed. Muhammad Ahmed happens to be the most common combination of, you know, two names that you can have in the world. And it turns out somebody on the terrorism watch list has the same name. So we get pulled into secondary. We're there long enough. By the time they sort this out, the plane has left. We missed the flight. A little while later, my father gets a job offer in Qatar, in the Arabian Gulf, which was at the time on its way to becoming the richest place on earth. And that sort of accident of fate, instead of me growing up in Libya, I now get to grow up in this place of, which eventually a few years later sort of like was gushing unimaginable wealth. It's very difficult for me to explain to somebody on this side of the planet just how extreme that is. Um, and I had nothing to do with that. And I sound the way I do. I have this accent as a result. Um, I write these books as a result. I live in this part of the world as a result. I had nothing to do with it. And so Vanna, I took a little bit of that from me. And, I, and, and Vanna's trying to contend with that. She's trying to figure out how to be a good person when so much of this stuff is a coin flip that happens before you're even born. Mm. The um, Again, we talked <clears throat> a little beforehand about um, as you mentioned, Peter Pan and some of the things that that's that stood out for me were the the, the mythological connections, right? Pan and and Vanna's last name is Hermes, and um, the 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 character of Hermes is this you know 
person who guides people. I mean, it's a very, very uh, um, multifaceted character, right? But one of their character traits is that they guide people, right? They, they're, they're sort of the, the patron saint of travelers, I suppose, if you want to call it that. Um, so maybe that was kind of part of her predestiny. <laughs> I don't know with that last name. <laughs> yeah, they, they guide a very specific kind of person, but yes, they, yes. they, guide, they guide people. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So you have these two um, two young characters. Um, can you talk a little bit about writing in the writing as a young person or writing writing for a young person? What what kind of challenges did that present to you? Um, a lot. And I don't know if I do it well. And I suspect many of my readers will argue that I don't do it well. That, um, but I'm drawn to that place. I mean, American War also starts off from the perspective of a child. A lot of my shorter stories include the perspective of a child. And I think one of the reasons I'm drawn to that place, um, you know, there are some specific reasons with what Strange Paradise. So, for example, because I grew up in Qatar, Qatar is only 10% Qatari. 90% of the population are people like us who came from somewhere else to cash in on the oil and gas money. And so you're in a situation where, you know, my dad was an accountant at a hotel and I'd be at the hotel beach playing around and some kid would come along and there was a very slim chance that we spoke the same language. Um, everybody's from somewhere else. And so a lot of the gestures and the things that are happening when these two children are trying to communicate with each other are things that I remember from my own childhood. Um, but the, I think the overarching reason I tend to go back to that place so often is because I think of childhood as sort of the time of our most honest interaction with the world um, before all of the conceits and contrivances of, of, of sort of adulthood and the lies we have to tell ourselves to get through the day sort of thing before any of that kicks in. The idea of the world as a, as a, a, a sort of staging ground for curiosity and a very sort of honest interaction. I think that's why I'm drawn there because so much of what I write about is sort of the stuff that makes me angry, you know, systemic injustice, the ways, the, the sort of built-in cruelties of our societies. And all of those things are institutional. And so, and also dependent on a kind of fraudulence. They're dependent on a, a series of lies. And to have something institutional and fraudulent collide with something individual and honest, I think is where a lot of my stories take place. So I think that's why I go back to, to childhood as a staging ground. That, but again, that doesn't mean that I know how to do this well or that I write children characters well. And I, it, it's just, uh, it's, there's something magnetic about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and speaking of institutionalized cruelty, we have the, the villain, <laughs> right? Colonel Kethros, um, who I, I guess also has the connection with with Pan with the with the prosthetic um, device, right? Um, yeah. Kethros though has undergone a lot of trauma, right, and has sort of led him to this place. What 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 is his backstory? Yeah, he's my Captain Hook, right? Instead of missing mm -hmm. missing a hand, he's he's missing a foot. That when he he was a peacekeeper, he's a soldier. He's he, when. He used to be a peacekeeper. He stepped on a landmine many years ago, lost a foot. Um, the name Kethros, I believe, is Greek for cedar. Um, Amir's name is Amir Utu. Utu is, I believe, the Mesopotamian god who in, in physical form most closely resembles Pan. Uh, Utu does not show up in a lot of ancient <laughs> literature. He's not a particularly popular character. One of the very few instances in which he shows up I think is in the Epic of Gilgamesh where he shows up in the cedar forest on Kethros cedar. Anyway, this is the sort of nonsense that is strewn throughout this book. <laughs> People who haven't read it, it, it's a book that survives a surface reading and it survives a very deep reading. It doesn't survive anything in the middle. <laughs> um, <laughs> so anyway, Kethros um, to me is someone who is, um, a lot of the villains in my books are the only the only honest characters, all the people who are morally concerned with moral goodness are constantly having to lie to themselves. The villains can lie to everyone else, but they're always honest with themselves. And, and Kethros has that quality. He's someone who um, has a very well-defined but shallow interpretations of what, interpretation of what it means to be a man. Um, you know, I remember when I was in high school, our physics teacher was always concerned with us never memorizing the formulas he always wanted to be wanted us to be able to derive the formulas from basic principles, from first principles. Mm 
Um, and I think uh, in terms of masculinity and what it means to be a man, Kethros has memorized the formulas. Um, so it results in this, you know, throughout the book, every now and then he'll, he'll perform this act of great chivalry, but he does it from a deeply toxic place because mm -hmm. he's sort of, he has this very shallow, brittle understanding of what it means to be a man. Uh, and he's chasing this boy, even though he shouldn't be. I mean, he's got better things to do. There's migrant ships washing up on the islands nearby. He's got a lot of work to do. And he sets it all aside because something about this boy getting away violates the sense of decorum. That's part of his understanding of what it means to be a strong, powerful man. And so he's a deeply, he's a deeply flawed, deeply brittle character. And he's one of my favorite in the book. I, I should take this up with my therapist, but the villains are, in my books are the ones that stick with me uh, a lot of the time. And he's he definitely fits that that bill. Well, I think I think villains are always the most compelling, right? I mean, they're and and it's interesting that you point that that almost kind of maniacal obsession with you know this one act. Um, when everything else is going on around him, right? He could be doing a dozen other things, but there's this this kind of uh, single-minded focus on on writing this particular thing because it's maybe something he can he can control, right? He can't control all of this other stuff, but he can control a nine-year-old boy. I don't know, but there's a a line toward the end of the book where he says, you know, hate me all you want, but at least to me you exist. To me, you never stopped existing. Can you unpack that? Yeah, I mean, this 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 ties in very closely to that idea of, of, you know, I go on and on about the privilege of instantaneous forgetting. And and he's, say what you will about him, he's not going to forget. Mm -hmm. um, which again has to do with this idea of what it means to be truly honest about a situation. Um, you know, I think around around that same section, he talks about this idea of all these people you think are on your side. They're going to cry for you. They're going to call their politicians. They're going to, and tomorrow it'll be as though you never existed. Um, and that's not the case for me, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, so um, it's it's a really fascinating point you make about the, about villains because I agree with you completely, right? They're they they're they're so often the most memorable to me, and yet I have this kind of very troubled relationship with that kind of character because of the context in which I write. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm an Arab Muslim guy who lives in, in America. So when I look at, you know, Hollywood, for example, and I see some interpretation of somebody who looks like me, they're, they're one of three things, right? They're either um, the, the, the bad guy who's a terrorist. They're the good guy who helps Jack Bauer catch the terrorist. Uh, or they run a fruit and vegetable stand in some Moroccan bazaar that Matt Damon destroys in a car chase, right? Like that's <laughs> essentially what, that's who we are, right? Um, and, and that's because there's levels of representation, right? At the very bottom, there's no representation. And then cartoonishly villain, you know, a cartoonish villain. And then there's cartoonishly good, which is someone trying to make up for all that other stuff by giving you a character who's pure as the driven snow. And towards the very top is when you get like really deep, interesting villain. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying my best to get to that place because I think it's really difficult. Um, particularly when you're talking about groups of human beings who have been subjected to the cartoonish villain treatment. And, and so I have a really shaky relationship with going to that place. Um, but I try my best to get there every time because those are the most memorable characters. And I think that they have, they have a deeply human worldview um, because they're free from certain, uh, they're not compelled to tell themselves lies just to get through the day. And that allows them to be human and sometimes in deeply evil ways, but allows them to be human nonetheless. Mm -hmm. Right. And he's very honest. I mean, he, he doesn't, he doesn't hide his feelings, right? He's, he's very honest about how he feels about all of this, um, which, which is a, uh, uh, a kind of an unusual trait for someone who, um, you know, on the on so many levels is is so. Um, uh, I don't know quite what the word is, but the, this lack of lack of virtue so much, and then he has this one virtue of being honest, of being so painfully honest, right? Yeah, yeah, it's. Um... You know, I mean, when he needs to lie to other people, he has uh, no problems about it. He's got a sociopath's level of, of sort of comfort <laughs> yeah. with that. But yeah. to himself, he's he's um, 
there's there's no no illusions um, about about who he is. Right, and it, and it, there's also I think this kind of interesting power dynamic, right? I mean, this this character is some is I think something that we can identify as somebody who possesses a lot of this um, this kind of contain power, right? This sort of martinet. Um, you know, his his sphere of influence is is relatively small, but he's going to wield that power, right? And everybody else around him is is sort of cowed by that power. But in in the big scheme of things, you know, there's still things he can't do, right? He can't, like I said, he can't stop the flow of migrants. He can't do any of this. Uh, so he has to he has to play that out in other ways. Um, yeah, he's he's um, he's 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 towards the end of his career, and he's been given a little bit of power. Mm -hmm. He's sort of he's been put on a babysitting mission, but um, that that in my experience has always been a really dangerous place. Somebody who thinks they should have a lot of power being given a little bit of power is always a really frightening um, combination, uh, yeah. and that obviously plays out throughout the book. Yeah. So you talk about representation and and. Um... I think one of the things we chatted about briefly before we started is is how often characters, how our perceptions of of um, refugees and anybody who is traveling from one place to another, their experience is sort of leveled out, right? Everybody is doing the same thing. Everybody is going for the same reason, um, and and yet on the boat, on the calypso, this fishing boat, we have. Um, a cast of characters, all of whom have their different backstories and their different motivations. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you can first of all talk about the sort of stratification of this of this boat, the Calypso, the sort of race and class stratification, because there's a there's a line early on when they first of all they go out in a in a ferry. And, and I think people think that's going to be the boat they're on. And then it pulls up next to this rickety old fishing boat. And then there's a sort of transfer across. And there's a, there's a line when um, Amir's um, uncle slash stepfather um, is bargaining to get him on the boat. And he, um, um, he, he's paid the, the price to, to go on the boat, but he, he wants Amir to go on as well. And so they bargain this uh, kind of uh, switch of places. And um, the, the, the smuggler says, um, you know, do you want to go down below? He says, you want to go down to the bottom deck, down with the Africans. And Quiet Uncle says, brother, there are Africans on both decks. <laughs> Uh, can you talk about that that sort of race and class stratification on that boat? And then after that, let's let's uh, uh, sort of uh, introduce some of these characters. Yeah. So so um, this is all this is all endemic to the actual sort of migrant route across the Mediterranean. Is that um, overwhelmingly the the skin color of folks in the lower decks is very different from those on the top decks. Um, so on the top, if, if this thing goes down, if the boat sinks, your chances of surviving are, are exponentially greater if you're in the top deck than if you're locked in the bottom. And um, a lot of these smugglers will tell you something like, no, no, this isn't a race thing. It's not like we just pick people who are darker skinned and put them at the bottom. This is purely a, a money thing. This is pure, you can buy your way. But of course, the sort of overriding you know, structure of injustice in, in the world has tilted towards this idea of doing with money what you previously used to only be able to do with chains. And so there's there's a fundamental fraudulence to the whole thing. Of course it is racist. Of course it is a deeply racist construction. Um, if you're Eritrean and you're trying to cross, there's there's two Eritreans on the boat and, and they've been arbitrarily given the task of piloting this thing, which essentially just means like, set it towards north. There's a little compass. Just make sure that points to N and you're you're on your way. But in in reality and in, in the reality of, of this this journey, if you're Eritrean and you're trying to make it to Europe, the boat trip, which is incredibly perilous, is maybe the least perilous part of that journey for you. 
getting out of Eritrea, going across the desert and going north with smugglers who genuinely don't care if you live or die is even more sort of uh, even more likely to result in your death than the boat trip. And the boat trip is very likely to result in your death. Um, so you have this guy on the boat, Muhammad, who's the smuggler's apprentice. He's the guy who is the Colonel Kethros of the before chapters. He's babysitting on the boat. And um, he's, you know, he's telling these people, no, no, it's a class thing. It's, it's a money thing. If they had money, they could be up here. But he knows full well that that's nonsense. He's, it's, it's, um, it's a construct to, to put a veneer of sort of legitimacy on something that at its core is, is um, deeply human and deeply evil at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's the story that they like to tell themselves, right? The, the story they like to believe. Yeah, or like the story that, that they have to sell these people on. Mm -hmm. um, because we were, so originally a lot of these folks end up on the boat having heard about it through some obscure Facebook group. And the Facebook group has pictures of cruise ships, you know, from the Disney cruise line and stuff. And that's, that's the image that, that they've been. And so the whole thing has a veneer of fraudulence about it that eventually, as you get closer and closer to the real thing starts to strip away. Um, but it begins with a, with a, with a fantasy. And I think this book is essentially just the collision of two fantasies. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of that happens on the boat. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the passengers that we meet on the Calypso, uh, you've already talked about uh, Muhammad, um, who I'd never, when you mentioned this sort of uh, uh, in the connection with uh, Colonel Kethros, I'd never made, <laughs> never made that that distinction, right? It's, it's like, of course, absolutely. I mean, he's the one with the gun, right? Um, talk a little bit about some of the other passengers um, and, and how they relate to each other, because I think some of those small scale interpersonal uh, relationships are fascinating and they, they're, they all have their own reasons and, and, and stories for being there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's, so there's uh, almost everything that happens on the boat in the book is, is on the top deck with these folks who are, there's a, there's a Syrian guy named uh, Walid bin Walid. There's a Palestinian guy named Maher. There's a, uh, um, two Egyptians, uh, plus Muhammad the Smuggler's Apprentice, who's also Egyptian. There's Amir, who got on the boat by accident. He thought he, he thought his uncle was sneaking off to take a cruise, and so he sneaks on after him, and all, it all goes to hell from there. Um, and so a lot of the conversations between these people are happening. Um, in one of the previous drafts, I actually interspersed the chapters with monologues from each of these folks talking about how they ended up on the boat. And I was in love with those, with those pieces, but they just didn't work on a structural level. They just mm -hmm. had to get rid of them. So that was 30,000 words that are just going to sit on my hard drive forever. But um, <laughs> they, um, I'm not one of those people who steals whole people from the real world and dumps them in the stories. I steal parts. Um, so a lot of these folks are little traits from people I grew up with in the Middle East, traits from my own family members, uh, things I've heard them say to one another. The only trait that I steal from myself is sort of a cowardice. So whenever one of my characters doesn't do the right thing or out of fear, it's usually it's usually something that's coming from, from me as a person and what I think I would do in that situation. Um, but they are, they're composites of the sort of people I grew up around. And the way they think about a lot of things, but particularly the West. And so when I talked about this collision of fantasies, there's the fantasy uh, in the West about these people that, oh, all these people are barbarians of the gate and we need to shut them out no matter what the cost. And then the fantasy headed in the other direction of if I can just get to the West, everything will be okay. And so they're one half of that and they're trying to rationalize it to themselves and they're trying to do it in some, in some cases, patently ridiculous ways, um, like Om Ibrahim, who's this pregnant woman sitting in the, in, the, in the boat, who's reading phonetically spelled out English, you know, in Arabic letters mm -hmm. uh, about how she's going to have a baby. So that as soon as she arrives, she can say, hello, I am going to have baby. I need hospital for, you know, um, they're, they're trying desperately to change what they can about themselves before they get to the place that has ultimately always represented change for them. So hmm. that's who they are. Hmm. That's interesting. You mentioned that. So, so in a sense, it's, it sounds like they're trying to, um, they're trying to create a, a, a 
how do I put this? That just what you said just really struck me in an interesting way, and I'm going to have a hard time putting it into words. So maybe I better not try. But it it's it sounds like this idea, this this um, this sort of idealized notion of the West and what their role is and who they should be. They're trying to create that, right? They're using this as a as a way to kind of iron out all of those imperfections and all of those things that they think are maybe going to um, uh, create obstacles or barriers to them. Is that did I get that right? Or yeah, I, absolutely. I think I mean one of the things about that is that at least in my experience, like it works, right? So I have I have cousins, I have relatives who look like I do, who have names like mine and who have a much, much harder time passing through airport security when they come to America. And the reason is because they don't sound like this, right? And I walk in and I say, hey, how's it going? And immediately you can sort of see the, the person's blood pressure kind of dip, right? Because I've, I've learned that, I've learned that over time mm -hmm. uh, to the point where I have, it's a skill set, right? Like I used, to, I used to walk up to TSA when I would go through the security thing or whatever, customs, and I used to always be like, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. And then I realized that that wasn't working for me and that what I should do is say, hey, how's it going? Because that's what the Americans are doing. That's what mm -hmm. the people who are supposed to be here are doing. And so you, you, you work on this skill set and it becomes, I mean, in, a, in, in an ideal world, none of this would be the case. None of this mm -hmm. would matter in the slightest, but it does. And some things you can't really change. I mean, I could try to change my name. I'm not going to change my skin color. I could try to fake my ethnicity, but... Some things you can, right? Because I've been going to American and British schools since I was five years old, so I sound like this. But there's a proven sort of benefit to undergoing these kind of changes. And if you can ignore the opportunity cost, which is essentially shedding yourself, shedding who you are for this fraudulent version of who you, who you are, if you can set that aside, then there's a proven benefit. And that is acceptance in this part of the world that you think is going to solve all your problems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, something you mentioned about the sort of competing realities, I, I was um, reminded of the conversation early on between um, Amir's mother and Mona in Damascus and this, um, this sort of like, well, why are you in Damascus? Well, because this is happening and the reaction is, well, it's all fake, right? So that, that, that strange sort of uh, uh, odd juxtaposition of realities that, I mean, we, <laughs> we're getting right now every day, right? In some form or fashion, right? That that what is pat patently happening in front of our eyes is, is uh, manufactured. Um, and, and it seems that, that a lot of what happens where those moments of conflict, we talk about, you know, you talk about the, the, the image of the ship that they're going to go out on, you know, this sort of like fancy boat. And then there's the reality of what, what, you know, what they're actually going to be on that level of kind of competing realities is just, it's, it's constantly creating tension, right. In, in, in that part of the world. And how, how do you square that, um, those competing realities? Yeah, it's, um, so that scene you're talking about, so the Amir's family has to escape their city, which has been bombed to shreds. And for a few days, they're staying at the, um, the home of a, of a very rich, uh, distant relative in, in one of the wealthier parts of Damascus. And she's telling, you know, Amir's mother is trying to describe that this happened to us. Like we, we you know, our house, our, our apartment building was, was shattered, was split, what, and this woman is saying, no, 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 that's just some stuff they make up in a soundstage in Qatar, which is a line that actually somebody, one of, one of my old friends said to me when we were talking about, we were talking about Syria. And he's fully convinced. He was like, no, no, Al Jazeera just does this stuff in a soundstage. None of this actually is actually happening. And it's, um, you know, American War, I don't think of as a book primarily about America. What Strange Paradise to me is much more a book about America than, than American War, but of course doesn't have American in the title and set somewhere else, so whatever. But um, the thing that terrifies me the most about this part of the world, which I see, I see echoes of in the part of the world where I grew up, is that, you know, there's always been people who believed fantasy. There's always been people who believe that the, 
the the cell phone wires are beaming, you know, things into your brain and the government's tracking you this way or the other and all of this stuff, right? And it used to be that if you believe that thing, your neighborhood of belief was pretty small. Mm -hmm. um, your choices were either to sort of downplay that or go live in the woods somewhere and send mail bombs to people, you know, sort of Unabomber style. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that has happened in this country in particular, but I think elsewhere in the world as well over the last 30 years or so, is not so much that there's a new brand of, of delusion. It's that the neighborhood surrounding it has expanded to include entire TV networks. And, you know, you believe that the COVID vaccine has a, has a tracking device in it. Not only is there like an entire online community that you can go and hang out with, if you want to do yoga and you want a yoga instructor who also believes that, you can probably find that on Facebook somewhere. The, the neighborhood has expanded mm -hmm. such that you can live in, an, in a silo of delusion and have so many amenities effectively lead every aspect of your life within this, not have to venture out of it. Um, and that to me is the most frightening sort of societal extrapolation is where that ends up. Um, because already you're in the situation where, you know, there it's, it's perfectly acceptable to live within one of these communities of delusion. Mm -hmm. And you can't have a functioning society in the long run. There's no societal fabric anymore. It's just a bunch of shreds. Um, that terrifies me. And I, I saw, I saw a lot of that where I grew up, but I'm seeing it at a, at a much larger scale in the, in the country where I now live. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've talked about, uh, growing up in in Egypt and and the the launch pad for the story is Alexandria, um, which I guess I don't think of as being. I mean, I I don't I don't know that that is, is something that I was aware of. Um, I, I'm 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 interested in in what why Alexandria. Yeah, it's a good question. You're absolutely right. It's not one of the well-known, certainly volume-wise, it doesn't compare to, you know, Libya or, or, or uh, uh, going through Turkey or anything like that. Um, there were a couple of reasons, one being personal. I wanted to get at the place, the places where I grew up and the places of which I have a memory, um, and also get at this notion of, of you know, what, what we do to one another. I mean, Egypt and Syria used to be the same country for a while. If I had been born a few years earlier, I would have also been born in Syria. It used to be a United Arab Republic. Um, and so it's not strangers who are exploiting these people. You know, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's brothers and sisters. Um, the other reason has to do with the sort of biblical structure of the book, the before and after Old Testament, New Testament. And so if I had a bunch of after chapters that were concerned with a miraculous rebirth, I wanted the the before chapters to be concerned with an exodus from Egypt. Uh, and so it would keep with my sort of Old Testament, New Testament uh, structure of the book. Um, but most, mostly I, 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 I know these places. I, I spent a little bit of my childhood there. And then I went back and forth when we were living in Qatar. I went back constantly. And so I wanted to get at some of the little um, little details of place. And so, you know, there's a kid who's... who's um, selling shirts to to a french tourist and he he speaks a smattering of 16 different languages but all he knows how to he knows how to make the sale in sort of 16 different languages that's that's very much a memory i have of that place that's a very sort of egyptian thing um mm. there's a crude joke uh that relies on uh on the reader's knowledge of a particular piece of egyptian profanity that's in there that's also you know like stuff like that um allowed me to 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 set that scene in a way that I don't think I could have otherwise. So big picture structural stuff uh, and, and the exact opposite sort of little, little details. Hmm. You talk about how uh, one of the sort of defining moments that, that served as the Genesis for, for this was uh, when you were uh, in 2012 and you were in Egypt and, and your uh, friend was commenting about the, the the two different price structures for for apartments um I, I i'm curious about i mean that was you know um right during arab spring and i mean 
and then Egypt. What happened? I mean, how how, how did uh, how did the e Egyptian reaction to Arab Spring strike you? I, so for me, it was um, so my father, who sort of marinated in Egypt, he loved that place. He grew up there, knew every poet, every politician, knew the history. Um, he passed away in late 2010, and he had always wanted to be buried back home in Egypt. So uh, he actually had a heart attack when my, him and my mom were on a cruise in, in Italy. So I had to fly to uh, Naples and and get all these all this paperwork from the embassies to fly the body back to Cairo. And we went to the City of the Dead, where there's the Elicad Mausoleum, where my my grandfather and my aunts are, are buried. Um, and we carried the body down in the shroud and, and sort of... Mm -hmm. A few months later was when the Arab Spring began. And I've always deeply regretted a lot of things that I didn't that I didn't get to say to my dad before before he died, but I always just really wanted to know what he would have made of that because for the entirety of my lifetime, there was one guy who ran the place and he pretended to be a civilian, but he'd come up through the military and it was essentially a military dictator. And then there was this moment of chaos, absolute chaos, when an entire generation had decided that they'd had enough. And if you ever go back and listen to the, the central chant of the revolutionaries in Egypt and Tahrir Square over those 18 days in January was sort of, you know, I think it was freedom, social justice, bread. And people always say like bread, what the hell? Like the other two seem pretty big picture. What the <laughs> hell is bread? But it was a reference to bread is the, the sort of staple food stuff in Egypt. Like everybody, regardless of class, that is the, the, the foundational nutrition is is loaves of arabic bread and they had become too expensive for for the sort of lower class of egypt to afford and and so it was a sense of of no you don't get to send an entire demographic to the wolves like we we won't let that happen that's what bread sort of reference was like you can't just make society essentially existence unaffordable um and for a second, I allowed myself to believe that this was going to, to work. But the thing about revolutions is that they tend to be sort of brush fires. You know, you, you clear the ground, but you don't get at the root system. And so after the, the revolution took place, the figurehead was deposed. And we had, we had something resembling free and fair elections. But the entire infrastructure of Egyptian sort of civic life, the judges and the deputy ministers and the people running all of various departments we're still loyal to the previous way of doing things. A revolution doesn't go at that, that end of the, of the equation. And so they elected a guy who didn't have any idea what he was doing. Uh, the military waited until they could seize the, the, the moment. They jumped back in and now we're back to square one with another military dictator pretending to be a civilian leader. That's the one lesson that whenever people on this side of the planet talk about revolution, revolution, I'm always like, yes, sure, absolutely. Just know that the default mode of revolution is often a brush fire. It's often a surface level thing. It's a much more difficult thing to pull the roots out of the ground. Um, and I think that's not, not to criticize the people who did this in Egypt. That's an impossible thing for them to have done. Mm -hmm. But I think that was one of the reasons why it was so easy to revert back to the way of doing things because you had 50 years of the old way of doing things and a couple of years of newness, and it scared the hell out of people who had been weaned on those fifty years. Right. Yeah. It's it's very difficult to to depose authoritarianism, right? Because that's what you're familiar with, and that's the story of so many. I mean, it's the story of the Soviet Union. It's the story of Russia, right? Uh, that there's been that person, that one person in power, that that figurehead. Um, I'm wondering. I, I, I'd like to, to wrap up this evening, and I, we didn't talk about this. I'm wondering um, if, if you can uh, uh, provide one final uh, bit of reading uh, as, we, as we go out. But before, while you're, while you're <laughs> looking for that, uh, the, I'm wondering, is, you know, I, I, you've done a lot of these recently. You've, you've um, you know, it's sort of your life for uh, a period after a book comes out um, or anything comes out. And I'm, I'm wondering, is there, is there something that you wish somebody would ask you about this book? You know, I, I'm sure you're going to think I say this all the time, but I don't, I don't get the privilege of this deeper reading in most of these events. And I, I'm not, I'm not criticizing other folks who do this, but I don't often 
get people talking to me about why a certain character's last name is their last name or what <laughs> reference it has to the Odyssey or what. And I'm, I'm deeply grateful for that. So thank you. Thank you, um, thank you. Thank you for doing that. I don't, I, I don't expect that. Um, <laughs> Well, that's what happens when you talk to a librarian. Um, right? I, I, it's librarians and indie bookstores. That's the entirety of my career. I owe the entirety <laughs> of my career to people like the good people at Powell's Books. And, and uh, it was actually the first, the first event I ever did in my life was in front of a bunch of librarians in, in Portland here. I was terrified. I, um, yeah, I think, I think the best possible future of any society is whatever's going on at, at the local library. Every time I walk down to the library and see the things, you know, the library of things, the first time I saw that, I thought, Oh my God, this is brilliant. This is why aren't we doing like, it's, it's, it's the best possible future is living, is living in there. Um, no, I think, I think. I try to remain cognizant of the idea that I'm, the period of time during which I'm around to explain and, and defend my book. It's such a like minute portion of this thing's lifespan. Um, and so I'm always eager. And you know, the men in my family don't live very long. I come from a long line of malfunctioning hearts. And, and so I'm always curious, you know, if I'm fortunate enough to make it sort of 50 years from now, if anybody's still talking about any of this, what, what the interpretation will be. That was especially true with American war, which is a book I finished two weeks before Donald Trump announced he was running for president and it ended up coming out four months into the Trump Trump administration has been read a certain way. As a result, I always wonder if, if it'll be read a different way once we're sort of further removed from that, that moment. Mm -hmm. And I think the same thing about this. I mean, one of the easiest things to call my book is timely, right? I, I often think of that as a kind of backhanded compliment. You know, it's, it's timely. There's stuff going on. That's really, you know, um, <laughs> And I, I wonder sometimes about what it's going to look like when it's not timely. Um, but that requires you to have a time machine. I will say I'm deeply grateful for the questions you asked today. That was this this has been this has been really fulfilling as far as these things go. Oh, so well, thank, thank you for you. that. Thank you. Well, could you uh, read us out? Yeah, sure. Um, so my my. Um, I, I bat like zero zero one on on paragraphs that that <laughs> resonate in my head after I finish them. If I'm very fortunate, I get one paragraph a book that I think of as as sort of something that stays with me. And so I'm going to read the chapter that happens to have that paragraph. There was a review of this book in the New York Times that was very generous, but but the one thing I loved the most was that they referenced this particular paragraph. Um, so anyway, this is not ruining anything because you already know that the boat has. As from the moment the book opens, you know that there's been a shipwreck. Um, this is one of the before chapters, one of the last before chapters. Um, and it's the moment of the shipwreck, I guess, is, is pretty well all you need to know. In the last moment, some held on dearly, leaving splinters of nail and streaks of blood between the boards. And although earlier the boat was filled with screaming, of these remaining few, none made a sound. Others, knowing now what was about to happen, what was inevitable, gave in, and without resistance were swept off the deck and into the water, and they too made no sound. In the distance, the island, the colored lights, the music. One final time, the waves lifted the calypso high. Under the force of a tumbling body, the mass snapped at its base. The sea overwhelmed drowning the bloom of limbs that struggled to escape the lower quarters. Turning past the point of rebound, the old fishing boat flung its last few occupants still hanging on to the far starboard side into the air. For an instant, the deck became perpendicular to the surface of the water and then, like a closing eyelid, met it. Amir took flight, headlong into the seaborne sky, the roof of the great inverted world. In meeting him, the water was not cold or concussive, but warm and tranquil. Its temperature, the temperature of a body, the temperature of blood. With ease and without pain, he flew past the surface, past the depths, past the places where light and life surrendered and the domain of stillness began. And then lower, farther, 
past the crest of a million interlocking bodies who'd braved this passage before him and come to rest at the bottom, sick with the secrets of their own unallowed mourning, past the smallest flower-white bones, past the world at the feet of the world, to the lowest deep, then a lower deep still, until finally to a dry womb of a place in which were kept safe and unchanging everyone he had ever known, and everyone each of those had ever known, outward forever to encompass the whole of the living and the lived. And each of these the boy met in their old lives and their new lives waiting. And from each drew confession, and each he felt into as though there were no barrier between them, no silo of self to keep a soul waiting. What beautiful rebellion to feel into another, to feel anything at all. And then he surfaced. Thank you for uh, sharing that and for uh, closing this evening with that uh, beautiful passage, Omar. It's been a great pleasure talking with you. Thank you for sharing your insights into uh, what strange paradise um, and uh, uh, forgiving of your time. It's been a, so a, a, a joy to chat with you. And, it was uh, a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for for everything, for the questions and for taking the time. I, I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, everyone who joined us tonight on uh, Facebook and YouTube. And uh, as always, we archive this. Uh, it will be available for you uh, the minute we close. So uh, let your friends uh, know about this. And uh, uh, we look forward to continuing to do uh, uh, virtual programs uh, for you in the future. And until next time, everybody, have a great evening, be safe, and we'll see you soon.